This is Sonic Control's DAW School, where you learn how to plan and buy the right computer system to record your music. So get ready, because here comes the teach. Hey everybody, I'm Peter Alexander, and welcome back to DAW School. Well, today we're going to talk about what makes a digital audio workstation a digital audio workstation. And to do that, we're going to go back in time and we're going to look at a piece of hardware that was the transition from hardware units over to computers. And then after we take a look at this unit, I'm going to take a few minutes at the end and put some prices in front of you so that you understand why computers are priced the way they are. And this will give you a point of comparison when you go out and shop. Now remember last time we talked about that there is this thing called a farm system, which a lot of guys that do recording have. These are separate computers. Now, on a farm system, you have the computer, a drive for the samples, you have an audio card, you have a MIDI interface, you have the program itself, the sample programs that you're working with, and then you have a virtual mixing board. And so all of those connect into one master system. And so all of that together makes for a digital audio workstation. So the prime criteria are you have a computer, you have an operating system, you have RAM that you can expand, you have a hard drive in which to put your samples, you have an audio card and a MIDI interface and sequencing. And on a farm machine, you have the same thing, except you don't have a sequencing program you have a virtual mixing board of some type that interfaces with the sample library programs you're working with. Now, one of the things I mentioned about the E5000 that was so appealing was that it came with 128 megabyte of RAM. At least you could order it with 128 megabyte of RAM. What was significant about that was this was a huge, huge breakthrough. But it points us into a direction of where things go and why they go that way. Previous to the E5000 was a unit called the Roland S760. That S760 contained, at the time, the whopping amount of RAM of 32 megabyte. And that particular piece of equipment cost around $3,500 or more, depending on where you bought it from. In a super studio, they would have 16 $3,500 S760s. The reason for 16 is one S760 was dedicated to each particular section of the orchestra. So one would be violins one, another would be violins two, and so on. Well, it doesn't take a lot of math to figure out that $3,500 times 16 is over $50,000 of hardware, not counting the computer, not counting the mixing board, and not counting something to record into. So we're talking about a huge sum of money in the 80s and 90s in order to have a studio to get going. Now when the E5000 came out, that was such a breakthrough because you could have 128 meg of RAM. So one E4 or one E5000 was the equivalent of four of these other Roland units. So guess what happened to the Roland units? They went the way of the dinosaurs, but without the meteor explosion to send them there. Now there are few around, but not too many. And so the buy-in price for the E5000 was $5,000. So you need four of them if you're going to do a lot of serious work in Los Angeles. So that was $20,000 for hardware. And so you can begin to see that the more RAM, the more you can do. And this is the whole thing that sample developers live for. They live for systems that have more RAM in it and faster processors because the faster the processor and the more RAM available allows them to create uh, sample libraries that are far more realistic than anything we had heard just even as much as five or six years ago. So speed and RAM makes a tremendous uh, difference and impact in creating a professional work studio. So pressing forward, we're now up to 
oh, I'm sorry, we're now down to a mere $20,000 just for the hardware of four E5s. And then one day, there's this group of people who came out of all places, Austin, Texas, and they developed a program called Giga Studio. And when Giga Studio came out without, within a year of its major release, um, the E4, the E5000, all went the way of the dinosaurs too. Because for one $2,500 computer, you could have the Giga Studio software, you could have 512 megabyte of RAM in which to load your samples or more. Eventually, some tweaks were made and you could load up one gigabytes worth of RAM of samples in a system that was running $2,700. Maybe $3,000 depending upon the quality of the audio cards and the MIDI interface you put on it. So in just a few years, the industry went from spending over $50,000 from being able to have 512 megabyte of RAM in 16 systems to having the same thing and more with a gigabyte of RAM by the time we got around to uh, Giga Studio 2.5 and later Giga Studio 3 for around $2,700. Now you can immediately see the drastic change that that made because with that price reduction for the first time, anybody could get in to start doing film scoring. Anybody could begin competing in Los Angeles because you could save up to get a computer that had the same potential as four or five $25,000 sets of E5s or $50,000 S760s. So now you could get in and you could compete. And that was one of the great exciting things about Giga Studio. Now, like an E5000, it was a standalone unit. You cannot run it um, on the same computer as you could your sequencing software. Although towards the end, they did develop a situation with Rewire that that was possible but it really wasn't as uh, effective as everybody had hoped for. So for the most part, everybody had Giga Studio on a separate machine. So even if you were a guy who was on the Mac, you had to have PCs in your studio. So it's very common to go into professional studios in LA and see somebody doing their primary recording work on a Mac and then having all these farm systems with Giga Studio. And there are hundreds, if not thousands of studios out there right now in Los Angeles, not counting what's out there in New York or London or Toronto with Giga Studio setups. And so this was a huge, huge breakthrough. But it goes to point the direction you need to be aware of, which is that it's going to be faster and more RAM. And those are very two important considerations for a digital audio workstation. The faster it is, the better the sample libraries, the more realistic the samples are going to be in terms of replicating real sounds, the more you can record, the more effects you can use, the more you can do on one piece of equipment. And that's one of the whole things that's going on right now with the digital audio revolution. So those are the issues that go to make up a digital audio workstation. And I've told you a little bit about how the prices impacted things. Let me tell you where the prices are roughly right now. When Giga Studio came out, you could have a pretty decent computer for between $2,500 and $3,200. Well, believe it or not, those prices have remained remarkably consistent even now with your 64-bit technology. Now, that's on the PC. If you're on the Mac, you can get lesser priced systems um, like a Mac Mini. I can't talk about the others because I don't, I don't have those, but if you have a Mac Pro, now you're talking about some bucks because there you could be spending anywhere from $7,500 to $9,500 for one machine that can handle, uh, let's see, 32 gigabytes of RAM. That's 32 gigabytes. So in just a few years, we've gone from having 512 megabyte of RAM into systems capable of handling 32 gigabytes of RAM. It's a huge change and it means great things that can happen, but it's also going to make for more expensive computers. So I want to tell you that in order to set your expectations 
So as you start poking around and seeing some of these prices, you have to remember where everything has been to understand where the pricing is now. But for the most part, depending upon the system you get, if it's going to be an 8 gigabyte system, it's going to run you between $27 and $3,200. Bucks. If you're going to get a 16 gigabyte system on the PC, you're looking at around $4,500, maybe $4,700 in general. And again, that's not counting the audio card and MIDI interface. And that's where we are with this episode of DAW School. I look forward to seeing you the next time.